So hello everyone. Um, it's lovely to be with you today and to talk to you about anthropology in general, but also what anthropology means now in the post pandemic world. I saw that in the Q&A there was one question. Uh, the last question was about possible questions that social anthropologists could examine about the post pandemic world. Um, I hope the, the, the next few minutes will give you an answer. Um, and the other questions, there are no more questions. Okay, so I hope everyone is um, well, wherever you are, I hope you're um, healthy, um, in good health and uh, keen to learn about anthropology. Uh, before we get started, can I have a show of hands with the raise hand function? Unfortunately, I can't um, see anyone uh, and I would have loved to interact with you, but the setting doesn't allow me to do that. But can I have a show of hands in the raise hand function um, from anyone who doesn't know what anthropology is? Do we have anyone in the audience um, who, do, who, would, who would want to know first what anthropology is? Or do you come here with um, some, some knowledge of what anthropology is? Okay. So most of you do have some um, idea about what anthropology does. And I hope that in the next um, half an hour or hour, however we are together, however long we are together, um, you will you leave this virtual room with some better idea of what, what um, anthropology is and what it can become now um, in the in the context of the pandemic. Before we get started, I might have to say a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Orkide Behuzan. Uh, I'm the convener of the medical anthropology uh, pathway at, uh, at the anthropology department at SOAS. I'm a physician, um, a former scientist, and an anthropologist of medicine and science and technology. Um, I studied in universities of Tehran, Oxford, and I obtained my doctorate degree from MIT in the program that I just mentioned, the history and anthropology of science and technology. So that's the background that, um, that kind of informs what I'm going to tell you. And um, I've been teaching medical anthropology and STS, science and technology studies, um, for over 10 years now in the United States and also here in the UK. Um, and for those of you who are applying to uh, social anthropology or other um, MA programs that we offer or medical anthropology, um, I will be the person who deals with um, the medical anthropology pathway. Um, <clears throat> so if, in order to talk about anthropology and the pandemic, um, I, I want to start with saying a little bit about what, um, what we think of the pandemic how we've experienced this past year. Um, the reason why I was so keen on interacting with you on the screen was that I wanted to ask you about this past year, the immense transformative experience that this year has been for everyone, regardless of how uh, they've been affected by the pandemic, whether medically or socially, or um, through, the, through your families, your loved ones, or even the you know, neighborhood around you, or the cities you've been in, or the movements that you've uh, been deprived of. Um, but think about those experiences and think about the pandemic not just as a medical problem or a public health problem, because it is not just a public health problem. Um, it is also a political problem. It is also a social problem. It is also his a historical entity. Um, it is also an economic uh, problem, as we all know um, about the impact of the pandemic on the economy. <clears throat> so as anthropologists, um, with medical anthropology, medical anthropology is the oldest and sort of largest subdiscipline within anthropology, uh, and it was kind of formalized in the 1970s. But people were doing medical anthropology even before that, even before the name of the discipline existed. But in anthropology uh, in general, and specifically in medical anthropology, um, we study a number of things. We study um, matters of health, um, matters pertaining to health in the context of um, historical, um, sociological, and political structures. In other words, 
we go beyond understanding health um, only in terms of biology or in terms of um, anatomy or physiology or how the body works or genetics or virology. We look at health um, in a broader sense, in the sense of what it is, what does it mean to live a good life? What, it is, what, how, what does it mean to live a life with integrity, with wholeness, within a particular or specific um, social, historical, political um, setting where we are located? That's a really lovely, cute cat. Um, we also study epidemics pandemics um, in the context of global health um, and uh, you know there are a lot of anthropological studies on um, HIV AIDS, uh, on cholera, on you know historical and anthropolo anthropological studies of um, epidemics and pandemics are actually what have uh, enabled us um, this past year to to sort of have the tools to think about and to approach this pandemic so whatever we've been discussing and, and, and uh, engaging with this past year rests upon a very long history and a very sizable uh, body of scholarship within anthropology on, uh, in general, public health issues, but also specifically epidemics and pandemics. We also study uh, mental health, which I, since the day that the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic hit, <clears throat> I've been very concerned with the parallel pandemic that is emerging with it. And that was, uh, that has been the mental health issues that it has caused. And um, that's something that I specifically personally work on. We also study um, health systems. We study the NHS. We study the health um, healthcare system in different countries, how they work, how they, um, I'm, I'm distracted by the chat, that's fine. <laughs> um, we study health structures. So a lot of what we will be talking about um, will hopefully make you think about your own experiences if you're in the UK, um, to think differently about what the NHS means, what its history can teach us, um, what happens to the NHS, uh, and it has been happening to the NHS, tells us about what kind of society we're becoming, um, and so on and so forth. We study how governments and organizations intersect with our experience of health. So if I have an illness, um, from the medical anthropological perspective, the illness is not just a private matter. The illness puts me in, in a very um, uh, uh, intimate relationship with, um, with politics, with governments, with the state, um, and with economic structures that, uh, that shape my experience of that particular illness. All of you have um, already you know, heard a lot about how different groups of people have been impacted by the pandemic in different ways. And the fact that you know, pandemics are not very democratic. They don't hit the poor and the uh, rich um, the same way. They don't hit um, minorities the same way as they hit their, you know, other populations, etc. Um, so the premise here is that any health-related entity, including illnesses, including epidemics, including pandemics, is not just a biological ent entity. In order to understand the pandemic, and this is why anthropology um, is is extremely important in. In, in our approach to the world that, that you know, the post-2020 world. We will need anthropological understandings of these notions because the premise is that these uh, experiences and these issues are not just biological issues. We cannot tackle the coronavirus pandemic only by understanding the virus and the vaccine and, um, you know, biology. We will have to understand the historical context that brought us here. We will have to understand the, the economic context that shaped our ability to deal with the pandemic in different ways in different countries. We will have to understand the political context that shaped the belief systems that led to decisions in different governments and by different governments, and also the perception and, and uh, reception of those policies in populations among lay people. We will have to understand the cultural elements, the cultural context of 
what it means to um, to experience a health issue that is sort of putting us all in in the same boat. We're all in it together. Um, what does that uh, do to neoliber neoliberalism? What does that do to capitalism? So there is a whole range of issues we need to understand to in order to tackle a pandemic. Um, and that's what health is really. So this is why I, you know, when I was thinking about, you know, for a taster se section on anthropology, I don't want this to be about medical anthropology. I'm using health. I mean, I want to, I want it to be about medical anthropology to some degree, but I'm using health as an example of how we approach um, uh, notions and concepts in anthropology. You can replace health here with um, with um, uh, climate change. You can replace it with food. You can replace it with um, um, uh, migration. All of these topics in anthropology, we approach them um, from these different angles, and we try to understand what they are in in a in sort of a holistic way. Um, and we also um, uh, want to emphasize here that um, health in general, and again, the pandemic in this particular instance, are issues that are also shaped by other structures, not just politics and history and, and economy, but also um, the experience of a pandemic, the social life of a pandemic has to make us think about notions such as gender, such as race, um, such as uh, social inequality, um, such as austerity, democracy, globalization, and technology, and freedom. So the, the way the past year has changed all of our lives, I mean, never did I even dream of being in a taster session looking at myself and Anna, uh, sorry, and, and Laura, um, you know, it, this 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 is a, this is a new experience. What has technology done to us, and what what where where is technology in the shaping of this pandemic? So we need to understand the world in in terms of technological advancements, in terms of how AI is shaping the future, how machine learning is shaping the future. What are the ethical stakes of all of these changes? What are the key bioethical and ethical questions of the next 10 years? So by the time you graduate and you uh, move into <clears throat> your um, uh, current or future careers, um, what, are the, what are the main questions, um, say, in 2030? Are we going to think about um, health or illness or technology the same way that we think now? I hope not. And I think one of the things that the pandemic has done is, has, is that in a way it's been giving the public a crash course in anthropology. Because without calling it anthropology, people have become more aware of these sociopolitical and historical and cultural aspects of health uh, because of the pandemic. Now, I'm gonna introduce you to a concept that we use in medical anthropology. Um, and, and I'm gonna use that to talk about COVID in a more, um, specific way. Um, just to get a sense of um, whether I'm speaking to, you know, void or not, can I have a um, show of hands through the raise hand function? Um, if you think, uh, if you want me to continue talking about, the, you know, COVID and this, this understanding of um, the pandemic through anthropology in order to give you a sense of what anthropology means in the post-pandemic world, just, um, show, you know, raise your hand, please. In other words, are we are we good to go in this direction? Ooh, ooh, wow, okay. Okay. Um I'm assuming that we can keep going, Laura. Okay, um, there is a concept in anthropology, uh, it's, it's a conceptual framework we use, um, and it's called medicalization. And what it means, 
medicalization. What it means is that, um, and, it, and I'm going to use this to give you a sense of how in anthropology, how we go about doing what I just said we do. We use specific conceptual frameworks, specific theories, and also ethnographic methods for our research. Um, I, I'd be happy to tell you more about ethnography and what our research method is in the Q&A, if you um, are interested in that. <clears throat> we also use these theories and conceptual frameworks in order to make sense of events and, and happenings and, and social phenomena. In medicalization, what we mean is um, medicalization is a social process whereby um, uh, human conditions that are, um, say, social, political, human conditions come under the purview of medicine. In other words, they become medical. So if I tell you, um, uh, you know, addiction, drug abuse, you can think about it in terms of a crim criminal matter. It could be a crime. There are countries where it's a crime to use drugs. And there are also other places where we approach addiction as an illness. When we approach it as an illness, we make it a medical problem. And therefore, what we're saying is that what is needed is the medical solution. So we don't put people in jail, we give them treatment. You see the difference? And so medicalization basically means exactly what the word implies, making something medical, a medical problem, making something a matter of medical understanding. Now, um, when we do this, we are, in, we are taking for granted a set of values. So, for example, if we treat a drug addict as, an, uh, as a patient rather than as a, a criminal, we are, we are basically using a different moral framework. We are mm, using a more uh, uh, human approach. We are believing in um, the right of healthcare for everyone. We're believing in certain rights for certain individuals. And so we are implying a different moral framework. Now, with medicalization, like everything else, um, there is, um, it's a double-edged sword. There are um, really positive outcomes of medicalization, like the one I just mentioned to you. When you make something, you turn something into an illness or into a medical problem, you're acknowledging, you're recognizing suffering, you're providing care, you're destigmatizing it. Um, you know, thinking about the history of HIV AIDS and how, for um, a, a painfully long time, so much stigma was attached to the illness. Um, and there had to, so much work had to be done in order to destigmatize it and, and, and acknowledge it um, as, a, as a viral condition, as a medical problem. Now, um, there are also other positive um, um, uh, outcomes. When we realize something, we can, we can improve the quality of life of someone. Um, we, can, um, we can also give them a sense of recognition and relief with things like chronic fatigue syndrome. Patients with chronic fatigue syndrome spend years and years getting misdiagnosed and going from this specialist to another specialist. And everyone tells them that it's all in your head and it, you know, there is no um, organic uh, cause or organic uh, um, thing to uh, pinpoint as a diagnosis. And then when they get the di diagnosis of, uh, of um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, it's not, a, it's not good news, but there's a lot of relief in getting a diagnosis because you're finally feeling like, okay, I, now at least I know what it is. Others are, are acknowledging my suffering and there might be something we can do about it and there will be care involved. So all of these things are positive outcome, outcomes of, uh, of medicalization. But medicalization can also do something rather negative, which is sometimes when we medicalize something, we are basically implying that it's only a medical problem. And we are in a way desocializing, depoliticizing it. You think about, um, say, uh, the example of uh, mental health, for example, which is my area, you, you can locate mental illness and mental health conditions in the individual, in the individual brain, 
as Western biomedicine does. And of course, you can medicate it and you can provide treatment and um, um, psychotherapy and medication, etc. But sometimes, and often, often actually, um, mental health problems are embedded in broader socio political and cultural and economic issues. You can't treat a problem uh, that is in effect has, is caused by social inequality, by poverty, by unemployment, uh, by racism, by um, you know, traumas that come from the society and from the violence of political structures, for example. So you can't, if when you reduce all of that to an illness, you individualize it, you make it the individual responsibility to deal with it or seek treatment or whatever, and you um, kind of wash your hands off you know, the responsibility of those broader structures. You kind of dismiss the role of politics, the role of economy, the role of um, social contexts, And so that's, that's a um, pretty dangerous thing that medicalization can do. So we have to always be aware of this um, double-edged double effect of medicalization. And why does that matter when we think about this past year, when we think about the world we are um, entering now in the aftermath of the pandemic? Um, basically, all of these conversations come down to um, an ethical question. The ethical question is, um, what kind of life do, do, do people deserve? Whose life matters? whose life doesn't matter, whose life is more valuable than uh, other lives. If you look at the <clears throat> experience of the pandemic in different countries, um, by now we all know how different countries at different points really messed up. Um, some got it really right. Um, some got it right and then got it wrong. Some got it wrong from the beginning, uh, unfortunately, in the, in the UK. Um, the, it, this hasn't been an easy journey because of decisions that were made irresponsibly or late or um, for reasons uh, uh, other than, uh, you know, the, the right reasons. In some countries like New Zealand, in Taiwan, in South Korea, you, you see a completely different kind of approach. And if you think about um, these different decisions that were made in the, in the face of the pandemic, um, the differences come down to one question. How much we value the, you know, our citizens, citizens' lives? It comes down to the feeling of how much is life, my life worth? And how, for, for, the, for citizens to feel whether their life was worth um, the right decision, whether they had a right to um, get the right information, get the right um, uh, initiatives and, and get the right, you know, for the frontline workers to get the right PPE for. So people have felt that their lives are to varying degrees um, in a way disposable. And that is an ethical question. It's not just a medical question. And this is why the question of medicalization comes in and is important because with the pandemic, um, in essence, one of the easiest things to do or um, especially for justifying um, wrong policies is to medicalize something. So for example, um, with, um, with the pandemic to focus, if you focus only on the virus and if you focus only on the science, which are absolutely necessary. And um, thankfully now we have, you know, we have the possibility of a vaccine, but a vaccine is not the only thing that can end a pandemic. It never has. We cannot end a pandemic just by vaccines. We also need all of those other structures that should have been there in the first place, um, the right decisions, decisions based on evidence, decisions based on uh, expertise and knowledge, <clears throat> decisions based on um, the, the democratic, democratization of information, access to information and transparency, and also cultural changes. You know, we, we've all become um, accustomed now to, you know, social distancing and wearing a mask and all of these behaviors that will take a while to get rid of, um, I think, when, when lockdown ends, um, you know, we, we, our bodies will take a while to adjust again to being close to others. 
But the danger of medicalization when it comes to, to issues like a pandemic that are both biomedical and sociopolitical uh, phenomena is, is that it reduces, um, uh, there, it reduces everything to biology and therefore absolves um, governments and health structures from their responsibility. Now, when we medicalize stuff, we also um, uh, are basically entering, with, with the pandemic, we're also entering into the realm of public health. So when we study pandemics, and when we study the impact of pandemics, whether it's the mental health impact, whether it's the economic impact, whether it's the social impact of the pandemic, um, we, we are also creating, we are creating a conversation with the field of public health. And therefore, we are also creating new categories of personhood. We are creating new terms such as um, high risk individual, spreaders, with the pandemic we've had spreaders. Um, we have patients, we have cases, we have uh, risk, risk factors. And so this in a way, in ways that we don't con consciously and constantly think about also has an impact on, um, on, on identities, on the way we identify with the world around us. Now, with COVID um, and with mental health, if you want to talk about more specifically about COVID, um, in, in medical anthropology, we have, um, uh, we have a number of approaches. And two of the major approaches that we, um, that we study things with are these two. One is um, called critical medical anthropology. In critical medical anthropology, we look at uh, the political economy of, um, of health. We look at this, uh, the uh, sociopolitical structures and contexts that shape the social life of an illness. We look at the social construction of illness. So we look at things such as social inequality, we look at things such as policies, such as um, uh, the, the way that um, the, the trajectory um, of, of an illness is tightly intertwined with um, uh, relationships of power, of gender, of race, of, um, uh, of class. And so in understanding these, um, uh, these, uh, this political economy, we basically ask how these sources of knowledge um, and social shape the social are shaped by and shape the social conditions of um, uh, of uh, the possibility of an illness. So, for example, if you think about um, if you think about the pandemic, the response uh, issues that have been talked about in the UK for a very long time now, um, you have seen in headlines. Um, headlines about how uh, minorities um, and BME uh, patients have had a higher mortality rate. You have seen uh, headlines about government response, um, the forces uh, that clashed between politics and science, the you know sage reports, the sage group, the, you know how science was articulated through politics, and vice versa. What are the political agendas behind these decisions? You've also um, seen a lot of headlines about comparing different countries. How come New Zealand got it right and we didn't? Um, how is it possible for the United States to get it so wrong? Um, you've also seen other headlines about um, secondary, um, quote unquote, deaths. Uh, for example, higher mortality rates with people who have um, chronic illnesses because their care has been disrupted because of the pandemic. Screening rates for cancer have dropped because the NHS was overloaded. And last but not least, you've, seen, you've heard and seen so much about the NHS. But the critical medical anthropology approach looks at not how the pandemic is causing these issues, because it's not. It's in a way unmasking, revealing problems, structural problems that were already there. You're talking about over 10 years of defunding the NHS, the national health system. What does that mean? I mean, that sentence is, we say it just like that, but for over 10 years, we've been reducing the capacities of our healthcare system, um, capacities that would be needed to respond to a pandemic. We even actually specifically, both in the UK and the US, 
um, uh, reduced pandemic response capacities in a very tragic way. And so this is how the questions of political decisions, the questions of political agendas are not separate from your experience or my experience or our grandparents' experience of, uh, of COVID. Everything is interconnected. And we also ask how these socioeconomic forces shape the experience of COVID. What is, what is the, um, you know, for the first time people have understood, um, for the first time in a long time, I mean, um, people have kind of started to pay attention to the fact that, you know, my body is not an island. We cannot just go and hoard, you know, um, toilet papers um, and think we are safe because no one will be safe unless everyone is safe because right now with vaccinations we will not be safe even if all of the uk gets vaccinated unless every country gets vaccinated and so these questions of um, inequality these questions of um, uh, distribution and access to healthcare uh, and rights to access to healthcare become extremely paramount and in terms of the nhs for example in critical medical anthropology we study how uh, these neoliberal policies have, <clears throat> have um, shaped not just the capacities of the NHS, which all of you by now know are, is at the verge of, uh, it's, it's under a lot of pressure, but also how it changes the life of a pandemic. In other words, in anthropology, when we say the social life of something, because everything has a social life. So when we say the social life of COVID, what we mean is how COVID is experienced, perceived, interpreted, um, even treated or, or cared for in different social contexts, in different political contexts, in different economic contexts. So in a way, that social life is some, somehow as important as the medical life of COVID. That we need to, the, the same way that we need to go for the virus, we also need to go for these problems such as racism, social inequality, and um, wrong policies. We have another approach in medical anthropology called um, the interpretive medical anthropology, where um, rather than looking at the political economy of, um, of illness and the social construction of illness, we look at um, the cultural and, and phenomenolo phenomenological meaning of experience. We look at subjective experience. We look at how people experience an <clears throat> illness or, um, or the aftermath of an illness or recovery from an illness or the risk for an illness. So the focus will become on, uh, on, on culture, which is a huge word. Um, we can also discuss what we mean by culture in anthropology because um, we, we usually use culture with an S as in plural. Um, we have cultures, we don't have a single culture. Culture is not a static entity, it's constantly evolving and in the making. Um, so in interpretive medical anthropology, we look at, we look at cultural um, formations that shape the experience of um, pandemic. We look at pain, we look at, for example, think about the experience of long COVID now. People who've been um, suffering from symptoms for months now. Um, how, uh, cultural understanding and linguistic understandings shape their experience, how experience is articulated. At the same time, how cultural um, uh, practices um, evolve through the experience of an illness. Um, you know, why is it that in some countries we have protests against masks and in some other places we don't? What does that even mean um, to have a belief system that, um, that protests wearing masks? What are, what are the trajectories of that way of thinking. So we focus on um, symbolics um, and on semantics and on uh, the symbolic meaning of things. The, the, the emphasis is on meaning. What does it mean to go through something? And how do these frameworks really help us in, um, in tackling the world that's ahead of us? We're looking at a, um, at a post-pandemic world where we have huge rates of unemployment where uh, waves of racism and sexism have been unmasked, unveiled, spoken about, um, have come to the surface. An awareness of um, uh, 
the responsibility of individuals to be involved in politics, to have, um, to have um, a voice, um, the, the flaws and premises of democracy, of globalization, of equality, have all come to the surface. So we can't get through this stage, through this moment in history, with just, um, with just a vaccine. We have to understand what this experience has brought to the surface. And that's where um, anthropology uh, comes in. Um, in summer, I, I, I was having an interview and um, I was basically, this was, this was a debate about, around what will the, I mean, it was in, I think it was early June, it was like a few months into the, um, into the pandemic. And the debate was, um, will, we, uh, will we forget when this ends? Because the idea was that this will end soon. And part of my answer was that it's not gonna end for a very long time. This is, this is gonna stay with us for, I'm sorry, but we will have a very difficult winter ahead of us. And my argument was the, 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 the thing that the pandemic has done is that it's medicalized politics. And in a way, it's politicized medicine. So it's done something extraordinary, which is it's brought these political debates into the world, into the world of health, um, healthcare and health debate. And it's also medicalized politics because our, our political um, philosophies and our political thinking now are, are intensely um, uh, impacted by um, immunological thinking. Even if you think about language, how notions of security and immunity uh, and risk um, sort of um, overlap between politics and health. And that's another um, conversation. Um, so I want you to think about um, the experience of this past year <clears throat> um, of yourself, uh, in your families, friends, people who have contracted the illness, people, um, unfortunately, uh, many of us have lost loved ones. Um, uh, the, the, the losses, the tragedies, and the anxieties. I want you to think about all of that and then think about it in a broader context of what it means for societies to go through that. What does that do to a society? What's the work ahead? What needs to be done in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? There is a before and after. I mean, 2020 will always be known um, as the year that this happened. And how, how does it compare with other historical um, examples, with the experience of, you know, the Spanish flu was, um, was uh, mentioned a lot early on in the pandemic, but also World War I, World War II, 9-11. Um, there are a lot of milestones that you can um, think about in terms of how they changed epistemologies um, in, a, in, a, in a mass scale. So I also want you to leave this room thinking about all the things that in the past you didn't think of as health issues. We usually don't think about um, gun violence as a health issue. Gun violence in the United States, unfortunately, that's also acknowledged. Um, another shooting just today um, in Atlanta. It's a disaster, it's a tragedy, but it's also a public health issue. It's not separate from questions of health. Racism is a public health issue because racism has a direct effect on how people have experienced COVID because we know that mortality rates and the severity of illness in, uh, uh, among minorities and ethnic groups has been, has been different. We also know that the vaccine uptake is different among minorities. Um, so racism cannot be separated from questions of health. Sexism is a public health issue, is a health issue, is interconnected with questions of health. Because there is a reason why some diseases have been less researched. Um, endometriosis has for decades been ignored because women's pain has been ignored. I mean, it's part of their life. It's just, you know, just get on with it. Why is it that we have so much more research on, say, back pain? Um, than on endometriosis, because back pain impacted the workforce. Historically, it impacted men more. It impacted women too, but they probably didn't, weren't hurt. So there is all of these um, sort of intertwined issues 
um, at the intersection of which you you come up with the experience of health, you you face the questions that are related to health. And so, um, domestic violence, racism, gun violence, um, sexism, all of these issues. I want you to think about them in in relation to how they impact health, how they shape our experience and understanding of health, and also how they have shaped our experience of this pandemic. Um, I think. Um, yeah, I think I just end by saying the the the, the um, I just want to emphasize also the importance of um, policy and how it's not an abstract issue. When we think about health policies, um, the same way that we think about climate change uh, or other other stuff. So replace health um, with other topics, and then you still get the same approach that anthropology offers. The importance of policy not as an abstract entity outside of the realm of experience but as something that is part and parcel of the way we experience life and how it's shaped um, uh, the, 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 how, how health then becomes a political matter um, and so much of this unfortunately is absent from the training of medicine like when when you go through medical school um, which is something i've done um, you don't you don't really hear much about these things. There there are few places and there are opportunities um, around the world for for an education that incorporates some of this, but it's not it's not um, widespread. And I think that's um, that's a shame. The same with engineering. The same with science. The same with all these other professions that can benefit from anthropological understandings of life and society and social phenomena, because then they will become better in their own uh, uh, field of expertise. Um, I'll stop there and I'll open to questions because I think I talk too much. We probably have um, about five minutes um, for questions and um, perhaps five minutes more, I'll double check if there's another session following on um, from this one on this particular um, zoom webinar but we have five minutes and there's been quite a lot of questions um and you want me to read over the questions then yeah if you want to have a look and then at the moment the students that are joining can't see the questions so if you want to answer a particular one if you just click answer live then they'll be able to see the questions that you're responding to um there's a question about um you're an offer holder in MA Social Anthropology. You want to know more about research supervisor system at, at SOAS. I, I would appreciate if you specify what you exactly mean. Like the, you know, if you are, you will have a supervisor for your uh, MA dissertation. Um, sometimes um, that person is the convener of the MA that you're studying, sometimes not, most of the time it is. And you will have, um, regular meetings with that supervisor throughout term two and term three in summer when you're working on your dissertation. I don't know how, I hope, I hope that answered the question. Um, <clears throat> I think Whale Taha has asked a question that I'm going, uh, that I already answered, I, I hope. <laughs> um, do you think it's still early for social anthropologists to examine the post pandemic world issues or phenomena um, no, I think it's late, um, post, post pandemic. Um, I think this is one of the issues that anthropology and social sciences in general, um, have because the perception of the outside world is that we have to wait for problems, um, and then call them to come and study them. Whereas my argument is anthropology should be part of the conversation from day one with immunology, with science, with genetics, with public health. Um, the same way that we go about addressing problems on the spot, <clears throat> because it's not a, a pandemic and a post pandemic and there's a line between them. How do you define post pandemic and post post pandemic? Um, you can, you know, we are already post pandemic in the sense that the past pandemic, pandemic has already happened. Um, you can also think about post pandemic, you know, 10 years after the pandemic. So I think um, my short answer is no, it's not too early. And it's also late, in fact. Um, um, the, the, okay, there's a question about the difference between the MA route, the research route, and the different pathways offered. The question, yeah, um, yes. Um, so the website um, is in the making. Unfortunately, 
I'm sad to say that the page uh, for medical anthropology actually is not live yet because we've, we've transformed the um, program um, a lot, quite a lot, but um, the website hasn't been as um, fast in catching up. So you, in social anthropology, if you choose a program in social anthropology, you can, you can choose a pathway in medical anthropology um, you also have the option of choosing different MA uh, programs in um, future uh, global futures um, and climate change, sustain sustainability, anthropology of food, anthropology of migration and diasporas. So these are different programs. The medical anthropology um, masters um, used to be a program, but now it's a pathway within the social anthropology program. That's purely administrative. The point is, if you want to study on medical anthropology, you, you choose medical anthropology, you check that box. It's called a pathway rather than a program, but that's really irrelevant. Um, and, you know, the, and the research route, if you, if you do an MRES, M research, that's the route that goes, um, that's if you want to pursue a PhD. That would be the first year would be your master's degree, and then three years, it's called three plus one, uh, the three years of the PhD. So that depends on whether you want to, um, do a PhD. I hope that answered your question. Um, how should we view surveillance and its explicit entrenchment due to the pandemic? Very good question. This could be this could be the topic of the whole other session on data. In fact, I was um, an hour ago. I was on Clubhouse, and I was um, part of a debate on AI and on um, data and how we are. You know, th this question of how we're handling our data to you know even right now you and i talking um you know i'm acutely aware of um, how my private space is now being surveyed um and this this data will go into clouds and i will not have any control over it and so all these ethical questions about data and about surveillance are extremely pertinent um to the pandemic and it's part of one of the many issues that sh that um that is included when, when we talk about post-pandemic issues? That's a very good question, um, Pravati. Um, post-pandemic world. How does a medical anthropologist approach change? Uh, the difference between medical anthropology and social anthropology is that um, medical anthropologists have um, a, a, you know, a, a sharper focus on on understanding the, the medical aspects of things as well. I mean, I'm personally also a physician. Uh, most medical anthropologists are not a physician, but one of the things you should do as a medical anthropologist is that you, you also have to um, educate yourself about the medical side of things. And that's, that's what good medical anthropology is. So you have to be able to converse in that language. You have to be able to um, engage with biomedical uh, knowledge forms and biomedical epistemologies. Um, with social anthropology, we do a broader approach. Medical anthropology has a sharper focus on, on the health issues and, and it studies topics that are more um, uh, health related in some way. But health in a broader, in the broadest sense, as I said, you know, it, you know racism is a health issue. Um, we, we're not just talking about illness and disease. Um, what is the difference between medical sociology and medical anthropology? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it's the difference between sociology and anthropology. Um, so sociology and anthropology, in a way, share a lot of, um, uh, they have a lot of commonalities. And part of that is because they use the same social theories, they use the same conceptual frameworks, they use the same theoretical approach. The way they differ, is in two ways. One is historically, they've had very different trajectories. They've had very different histories throughout the 20th century. Um, and, and those distinct histories, which we have no time to go into, have kind of shaped um, different characters for the two disciplines. But the core difference, the core difference is methodology. Anthropologists use ethnography as a research method, among other methods, but ethnography is the key um, research method in anthropology. With sociology, it's more about surveys and larger scale studies. Sociology relies more on 
And these are generalizations because there are sociologists who are also ethnographers. There's a lot of overlap and crisscross, but sociology historically relied more on quantitative data, on surveys, etc., and anthropology relied more on uh, ethnography, qualitative um, research. But right now, honestly, the, the lines are blurred because a lot of medical medical sociology programs um, and colleagues do the same things. We are, we collaborate. Um, depends on university, differs from university to university because the, his, the, the historical legacies shape how the programs um, work differently. Um, and what about medical politics, which I see they study at King's College London. I don't know what program you're referring to, Edward, um, if you want to um, specify that. So, we had a war in Croatia when I was a child, and I have experience with dealing with it. We have to stabilize the economy in the most possible way. And stream. You can see the question. Um, I study Americanism, and Chinese are now attached. Can we can fight that only by educating some person? I'm not sure what the question is. I agree with everything you're saying, uh, Shrinka. If you'd like to ask a more specific question, please do so. Um, Thank you so much for this. What methods have medical anthropologists used for ethnography during the pandemic and lockdown? Um, this is a very good question. There's been a lot of debate going on. Um, you know, ethnography has so many different um, branches, and one of those branches is digital ethnography and virtual ethnography. There are a lot, there's a lot of literature on how they differ. Um, and and, and a, a lot of ethnography is also about participant observation not just interviews, but also being part and part of an experience, being not just an observer, but a participant observer, meaning becoming a member of that quote unquote tribe that you're studying. And with the pandemic, there's so many studies going on with, for example, there's a fantastic um, project at, um, at UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania uh, called Pandemic Journaling Project. And basically worldwide, they're, they're collecting people's diary, you know, they're asking people to write diaries and journal entries, and they're and analyzing narratives. Um, that's, that's also ethnography. You know, there's a lot of ways in which you can um, do discourse analysis. You can do, um, you know, you can analyze what's going on in the media, in the news, in art, in literature, in cultural productions. And so people have been doing a lot of that uh, lately, there's a lot of work with photography, with um, with writing, with poetry, uh, and of course with patients. Um, we have master students in our medical anthropology program who are writing their dissertations on uh, healthcare workers, on frontline workers, on uh, the, their experience and the mental health impact on them. Um, some are writing about um, patients who've had COVID. So there is still a lot you can do. Uh, in other words, ethnography is not necessarily about traveling somewhere far away. You can do ethnography at home too. Um, we sorry, we probably just have time for one more question, um, and then we'll okay. have to bring the session to a close. Uh, the answer to this question is yes. Let me choose a question. Um, I don't know which one to choose. Um, <laughs> just while you're um choosing a question that will give you a little chance to read them just for anyone who is on the call and who has any questions just about the application process or admission or how that works please feel free um, to email I'll put my email in the chat and if you have um, a question relating to the session you can also email me and I'll forward your email um, on and make sure that it gets to the right person am I still taking one question or not yeah um uh, <laughs> There is a good question here from Melena. What are the usual career paths after an MA in anthropology? Um, options are unlimited. Um, anthropologists, you, you know, either end up in academia, you can become an academic like us. Um, you can become um, a practitioner in whatever field that you're interested in and apply your anthropological knowledge there. You can you can be an engineer and apply your anthropological knowledge there. There is a field called applied anthropology. So there's a whole applied range of uh, professions where you can be pr a practitioner um, with an anthropological um, approach. 
There is also um, a lot of consultancy work, uh, advisory work, uh, people going to policy, um, many people going to NGOs, organizations, um, and um, you know, some people start up their own business. You can, and, and there are different fields in anthropology. There is anthropology, business anthropology, there's corporate anthropology, there's medical anthropology. So it's really a wide range of career options um, that you, you know, you can, if you write to us, we can, we can discuss this in more detail. Perfect. I think we will unfortunately have to um, draw the session to a close, which we've got so many good questions still in the chat. Um, but thank you so much to everybody for um, joining us. I have put my email in the chat. Do feel free and we can um, to get in touch and we can make sure that they get to the department, the relevant person, and that we can get um, all of the answers that you need. Um, so yes, yeah, feel free to follow up. You'll be able to watch the recording back in hopefully about a week's time alongside all of the other taster sessions that have been running in this week. But thank you very much for joining us and um, we hope to see some of you at SOAS soon. Thank you so much. Thank you and good luck with your applications for those of you who are applying. Thank you.